Hello and welcome to a live stream of Arnold Toynbee's Civilization on Trial. We are resuming where we last left off in Chapter 5. This is a little bit of a special stream because, of course, this is right after Christmas. I hope you had a pleasant Christmas. And we're able to spend time with your family and friends, hopefully avoiding controversy, and instead just loving your fa friends and family. So, I have gotten all set up over here, where I am, and I have some lovely Lady Grey tea, which I actually used uh, eggnog as creamer since I don't have any milk, and it's actually pretty good. I was pleasantly surprised. Has a distinctively honey, little bit of a like a spiced honey taste, which is excellent. I really enjoy it. Um, and down the road, I, I imagine this stream is probably going to take uh, about an hour and 20 minutes, an hour 30 minutes, based on what I know of the chapter and on some of the previous streams. They have definitely ran long, particularly that first one that I did with the preface. No, I, th that's a different series, actually. That's ex Twitter exclusive, actually. So, yes, I am on Twitter at The Reformed Rogue, and I'm doing, uh, let's see, where is it? on my bookshelf right in front of me somewhere but i'm doing brooks adams the law of civilization and decay over on twitter so let me let me get a drink and we will get started here so this is Episode 5, The Unification of the World and the Change in Historical Perspective. Familiarity is the opiate of the imagination. And just because every Western schoolboy knows that the oceanic discoveries of voyages of discovery made by West European marinas some four and a half centuries ago were an, were an epic-making historical event, Adult Western minds are apt to take the consequences for granted. In addressing myself to a Western public, I shall therefore make no apology for pointing out how dramatic and how revolutionary the effect of our ocean-faring ancestors' exploit has been. It has produced nothing less than a complete transformation of the map of the world. Not, of course, the physical map, but the human layout of that portion of the surface of our planet that is traversable and, in and habitable by mankind, and that the Greeks used to call the oikumene. This Western-made change in man's human environment will be my first topic, but it leads on to two others. External changes of this magnitude usually evoke corresponding readjustments in people's attitudes. And, sure enough, when we look around us, we can see that, among the great majority of mankind, the f effects of those Western voyages of discovery, recent though they are on even the shortest sighted historical timescale, have, in fact, already brought about a drastic change in historical outlook. This will be my second topic, but it will bring up a third by laying bare a paradox. The majority of mankind that I here have in mind is, of course, the non-Western part, and the paradox is that today, we Westerners are the only pre people in the world whose outlook on history still remains pre dargamon Personally, I do not believe that this antediluvian Western traditional historical outlook is going to last much longer. I have no doubt that a reorientation is in store for us in our turn, and in our case, I fancy, it will be one of in the literal meaning of the word. But why should we wait for history? 
like some 18th century Prussian drill sergeant, to take us by the scruff of the neck and twist our heads straight for us. Though our neighbors have recently been re-educated in this unpleasant and humiliating way, we ought surely to do better, for we cannot plead that we have been taken by surprise, as they were. The facts stare us in the face, and, by exercising our historical imagination, we can perhaps anticipate the compulsory education that is already on its way to us. The Greek Stoic philosopher Cleanthes prays to Zeus and fate for grace to follow their lead of his own will without flinching. For if, he adds, I quell and rebel, I shall have to follow just the same. Let us now plunge into our subject by reminding ourselves of the revolutionary change in the map. One knows that mankind, being human, human, is always and everywhere in danger of exaggerating the historical importance of contemporary events because of their personal importance to the particular generation that happens to be overtaken by them. All the same, I will hazard the guess that, when the age in which we find ourselves, uh, which we ourselves are living, has been left sufficiently far behind to be seen by future historians in a revealingly remote perspective, the particularly cont particular contemporary event with which we are now concerned will stand out like a mountain peak on the horizon of the past. By the age in which we are living, I mean the last five or six thousand years within which mankind, having been, been human for at least six hundred thousand years before that, attained the modest level of social and moral achievement that we call civilization. I call the recent change in the map contemporary, because the four or five centuries during which it has been t taking place are a twinkling in an, of an eye on the timescale that our geologists and astro astronomers have now revealed to us. And when I am trying to picture to myself the perspective in which the events of these last few thousand years will appear to future historians, I am thinking of historians living 20,000 or 100,000 year years later than the present date, taking it on faith from our modern Western scientists that there has been life on this planet for, for about 500 million years already, and that the planet will continue to be habitable for at least as long again, unless Western man's precocious technological know-how cuts the story short. I'm going to grab some tea here. <clears throat> if the claim that I am making for the historic importance of our subject seems a large one, let us recall how extraordinary an event this change in the map has been. It has, I suggest, two aspects, of which the second is the more sensational. In the first place, since about 1500 AD, to reckon in terms of our Western parochial era, mankind has been gathered into a single worldwide society. From the dawn of history to about that date, the earthly home of man had been divided into many isolated mansions. Since about 1500, the re human race has brought under one roof. This has been accomplished, under God, by human action. And here we come to the really sensational point. The agent of this revolutionary change in the affairs of men might have been any one of the diverse parochial societies that were on the map when the revolution was put in hand. But the particular parochial society that has actually done the deed is the one that, of all of them, was the most unlikely candidate. In an effort to jump clear of my we native western standing ground, and to look at this question from a less eccentric point of view, I have asked myself who was the most centrally placed and most intelligent observer that I could think of among notable non-westerners who are alive at the moment when a few ships' companies of western mariners embarked on the enterprise of unifying the world. 
and I have found my man in the Emperor Babor. Babor was a descendant in the fifth generation of Tamerlane, the Trans-Oxanian conqueror who made the last attempt to unify the world by land operations from a continental center. Within Babur's lifetime, 1483 to 1350 A- 1530 AD, Columbus reached America by sea from Spain and da Gama, India from Portugal. Babur started his, started his career as a prince of Fagana in the upper valley of the Jaxartes, a small country which had been the center of the Oikumene since the 2nd century BC. Babur invaded India overland 21 years after da Gama had arrived there by sea. Last but not least, Babur was a man of letters whose brilliant autobiography in his Turkish mother tongue reveals a spirit of outstanding intelligence and perceptiveness. What was Babur's horizon? To the east of Haghana, it included both India and China, and to the west it had extended to Babur's own distant kinsmen, the Ottoman Turks. <clears throat> Good tea. Babur took lessons from the Osmanlis in military technique, and he admired them for their piety and prowess in extending the bounds of Islam. He refers to them as the, as the Ghazis of Rum, the happy warriors who had succeeded where the primitive Muslim Arabs had signally failed. In conquering, hit, in conquering for Islam the homeland of Eastern Orthodox Christendom, I could not recollect any mention of Western Christendom in Babur's memoirs, and I have found none in the exhaustive geographical index of Mrs. Beveridge, Beveridge's magnificent English translation. Of course, Babur was aware of the existence of the Franks, for he was a cultivated man, and he knew his Islamic history. If he had occasion to allude to them, he probably would have described them as ferocious but frustrated infidels living in a remote corner of the world at the extreme western tip of one of the many peninsulas of the continent of Asia. About 400 years before his time, he would have gone on to relate, these barbarians had made a demonic attempt to break out of their cramped and uninviting corner into the broader and richer domains of Rum and Dar al-Islam. It had been a critical moment for the destinies of civilization, but the uncouth aggressors had been foiled by the genius of Saladin, and their, and their military reverses had been capped by a crushing moral defeat when the Christians of Rum, faced with a choice between two alternative future masters, chose the side of the angels by opting for the prophet turban in preference to the pope's tiara, and accepted the boon of an Ottoman peace. The arrival of Frankish ships in India in 1498 and AD, 20 years before Babur's own first descent upon India in 1519 AD, seems to have escaped Babur's attention, unless his silence is to be explained not by ignorance of the event, but by a feeling that the wanderings of these water gypsies were unworthy of a historian's notice. So this allegedly intelligent Transoxanian man of letters and man of action was blind to the portent of the Portuguese circumnavigation of Africa? He failed to perceive that the, these ocean-faring Franks had turned the flank of Islam and taken her in the rear? Yes, I believe Babur would, would have been utterly astonished if he had been told that the empire which he was founding in, in India was soon to pass from his descendants to Frankish successors. He had no inkling of the change that was to come over the face of the world between his generation and ours. But this, I submit, is not a reflection on Babur's intelligence. It is one more indication of the queerness of the major event in the history of the world in our time. Since 1500 AD, 
The map of the Oikumene has indeed been transformed out of all recognition. Down to that date, it was composed of a belt of civilizations girdling the old world from the Japanese Isles on the northwest, northeast to the British Isles on the northwest. Japan, China, Indi- Indochina, Indonesia, India, Dar al Islam, the Orthodox Christendom of Rum, and another Christendom in the West. Though this belt sagged down in the middle from the North Temperate Zone to the Equator, and thus ran through a fairly wide range of climates and physical environments, the social structure and cultural character of these societies was singularly uniform. Each of them considered a, um, consisted of a mass of peasants, living and working under, the, m- under much the same conditions as their forefathers on the morrow of the invention of agriculture some six to eight thousand years back, and a small minority of rulers enjoying a monopoly of power, surplus wealth, leisure, knowledge, and skill which in turn enhanced their power. There had been one or two, two earlier generations of civilizations of the same type in the Old World. In 1500 AD, some of these were still remembered, while others, since brought to light by modern Western archaeologists, had been forgotten. There were two of the same type in existence at this date in the New World, unknown to those of the Old World and barely known even to each other. The living civilizations of the Old World were in touch with each other, though not so closely as to be, or feel themselves to be, members of a single society. Their contact, such as it was, down to 1500 AD, had been established and maintained along two different lines of communication. There was a maritime line which will be familiar to latter-day Westerners as the Peninsula and Oriental Steamship Company's route to Kobe from Tilbury. In 1500 AD, and indeed as recently as the time of a great uncle of mine, a vivid memory of my childhood, who commanded one of the East Honorable India Company's passenger sailing ships and retired from the sea before the cutting of the Suez Canal without ever having served on board a steamer, This waterway through a chain of inland seas was broken by a portage between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, with an alternative portage between the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. In the Mediterranean and Japanese section of this maritime route, traffic had frequently been lively, and from about 120 BC onwards, an infectious wave of maritime enterprise set in motion by Greek marinas from from Alexandria, who found their way to Ceylon, had travelled on eastwards, through Indonesia, till it had carried Polynesian canoes to to Easter Island. Yet, adventurous and romantic as these pre-Western seafarers were, the water route that they opened up never came to be of more than secondary importance as a line of communication between the civilizations. The main line was provided by the chain of steppes and deserts, that cut across the belt of civilizations from Sahara to Mongolia. For human purposes, the steppe was an inland sea, which in virtue of happening to be dry, was of higher con- conductivity for human inco- intercourse than the salt water sea ever was before the close of the 15th century of the Christian era. This waterless sea had its dry-shod ships and its keyless ports. The steppe galleons were camels, the steppe gal- step galleys horses, and the steppe car- ports caravan cities, ports of coal on, o- on oasis islands, and termini upon the, on the coast where the sand waves of the desert broke upon the sown. Petra and Palmyra, Damascus and Ur, Tamerlane, Samarkand, and the Chinese Emporia at the gates of the Great Wall. Step traversing horses, not ocean traveling sailing ships, were the sovereign means of locomotion by which the separate civilizations of the world, 
as it was before 1580, 1500 AD, were linked together, to the slight extent to which they did maintain contact with each other. In that world, as you see, Babur's Fakhana was the central point, and the Turks were, in Babur's day, the central family of nations. A Turco-centric history of the world has been published in our lifetime by the latest in the series of the great Ottoman Turkish westernizer, President Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. It was a brilliant device for restoring the morale of his fellow countrymen, but it was a still more brilliant feat of genuine historical intuition, for from the 4th century of the Christian era, when they pushed the last of their Indo-European-speaking predecessors off the steppe, down to the 17th century, which witnessed the collapse of the Ottoman, the Safawi, and the Timurid Turkish dynasties in their respective domains of Rum in Iran, India, the Turkish-speaking peoples were really the keystone, really were the keystone of the Asiatic arc from which the pre-Degaman belt of civilizations hung suspended. <clears throat> During those 1,200 years, the overland link between the separate civilizations was commanded by Turkish steppe power, and from their central position in this pre-Dagaman world, the Turks rode out, conquering and to conquer, east and west, south and south and north, to Manchuria and Algeria, to the Ukraine and to the Deccan. But now we come to the Great Revolution a technological revolution by which the West made its fortune, got the better of all the other living civilizations, and forcibly united them into a single society of literally worldwide range. The revolutionary Western invention was the substitution of the ocean for the steppe as the principal medium of world communication. This use of the ocean, first by sailing ships and then by steamships, enabled the West to unify the whole inhabited and habitable world, including the Americas. Babur's Fakhana had been the central point of a world united by horse traffic over the steppe. But in Babur's lifetime, the center of the world made a sudden big jump. From the heart of the continent, it jumped to its extreme western verge, and, after hovering around Seville and Lisbon, it settled for a time in Elizabeth's England. In our own lifetime, we have seen this volatile world centre flit again from London to New York, but this shift to a still more eccentric position on the far side of the Herring Pond is a local movement, not comparable in magnitude to the jump, in Babur's day, from the steppe ports of Central Asia to the ocean ports of the Atlantic. That huge jump was caused by a sudden revolution in the means of locomotion. The steppe ports were put out of action when the ocean-going sailing ship superseded the camel and the horse. And now that, under our eyes, the ocean-going steamship is being superseded by the aeroplane, we may ask ourselves whether the center of the world is not likely to jump again, and this time as sensationally as in the 16th century under the impetus of a technological revolution that is at least as radical as the 16th century substitution of Dagama's caravel for Babur's Tipuchak. I will recur to this possibility before I conclude. Meanwhile, before we roll up Babur's overland map of the world and unfurl the maritime map that has held the field from Babur's day to ours, let us call the role of the separate civilizations among which the human race was partitioned down to Babur's day and interrogate them briefly about their historical outlook. <clears throat> really enjoying this tea. The uniformity which these separate civilizations in their cultural character and their social structure extends to their historical outlook as well. 
Every one of them was convinced that it was the only civilized society in the world, and that the rest of mankind were barbarians, untouchables, or infidels. In holding this view, it is evident that at least five out of the six pre dagaman civilizations must, an er be, must have been in error, and the sequel has shown that actually not one of them was right. All variants of a fallacy are no doubt equally untrue, but they may not all be equally preposterous, and it is instructive to run through these half-dozen rival and mutually incompatible versions of a common chosen people, in an ascending order of their defiance of common sense. For the Chinese, their compartment of the surface of the earth was all that is under heaven, and the territory of the imperial government's immediate rule was the Middle Kingdom. This point of view is expressed with a serene assurance in the celebrated reply of the great Emperor Qianlong, Emperor Abad, 1735 to 95 AD, to a letter from King George III of Great Britain proposing that the two potentates should enter into di diplomatic and commercial relations with each other. As to your entreaty to send one of your nationals to be accredited to my celestial court and to be in control of your country's trade with China, this, this request is contrary to all usage of my dynasty, and cannot possibly be entertained. Our ceremonies and code of laws differ so completely from your own that, even if your envoy were able to acquire the rudiments of our civilization, you could not possibly transplant our manners and customs to your alien soil. Swaying the wide world, I have but one aim in view, namely to maintain a perfect governance and to fulfill the duties of state. I see no value, set no value, on objects strange or ingenious, and have no use for your country's manufactures. If the barbarian envoy, Lord McCartney, had divulged the awkward fact that his royal master periodically went out of his mind, the emperor would not have been surprised. No sane barbarian princeling would have had the audacity to address the Son of Heaven as though he were his equal, and the tone, taken in all innocence, by the draftsmen of the British missive, was indeed bound to appear, as out to appear outrageous in the light of history as known to Qianlong and his entourage. Qianlong himself had made history by subjugating the last wilds of the Eurasian steppe, and thereby bringing to an end a duel between the desert and the Sone, that had been one of the main threads in the weft of human history for the past three thousand years. The Son of Heaven had achieved this historic feat virtually single-handed. The only other party that could claim any share in the honours was the Caesar at Moscow. The South Sea Barbarians, as the Chinese called the Western Water Gypsies, who had been washed up against the south coast of China from that direction, had no hand at all in the great, this great victory or the cause of sedentary civilization. But the personal achievements of the statesman and war, warrior Qianlong could add little to the effulgence radiating from the Son of Heaven ex officio. The empire over which he ruled was the oldest, most successful, and most benefi beneficent of all living political institutions. Its foundation in the 3rd century BC had given a civilized world a civilized government conducted by a competitively recruited and highly cultivated civil service, in place of an international anarchy in which a number of parochial states dominated by a hereditary feudal nobility, had plagued mankind by waging perpetual wars with one another. During the twenty intervening centuries, this carefully ordered world peace had occasionally lapsed, lapsed, but such lapses had always been temporary. And, at the close of Qianlong's reign, the latest restoration of the Middle Kingdom was in its heyday, 
this political casket had preserved an intellectual treasure. The findings of schools of philosophy, which had explored all the alternative answers to the fundamental questions of metaphysics and ethics, and the children of the Middle Kingdom, had shown that their inborn intelligence and statesmanship were matched by their broad-mindedness when they had adopted a great alien religion, the Indian-born Mahayana, to meet any spiritual needs that their secular civilization might not be able to meet entirely out of its own resources. On the strength of this historical background, was Qianlong right in answering George III as he did? Doubtless, some of my Western readers smiled as they read his answer. They smiled, of course, because they knew the sequel. But what does the sequel prove? It proves, no doubt, that the Emperor Qianlong and his advisers were unaware of the overwhelming physical power which the South Sea barbarians had acquired from their practical applications of new discoveries in physical science. At the date of Lord McCartney's mission, there were Chinese men of letters, already in the flower of their age and holding responsible positions in the imperial service, who were to live to see Great Britain make war on China and dictate terms of peace to her at the cannon's mouth. But not but does not this very sequel also prove that Qianlong was as wise in his policy of non-intercourse as he was out of date in his information about the South Sea barbarians' military caliber? His intuition had warned him against trafficking in strange or ingenious British wares, and one very strange ware that the British merchants offered to the imperial government's subjects was opium. When the imperial authorities banned the traffic, as a respectable government was bound to do, the barbarians took advantage of their unsuspected military superiority to blast an entry by naval gunfire for British trade in India and in, in China, forgive me, on British terms. I know this is a simplification of the story of the Opium War, but in essence it is the truth and the best that can be said for the perpetrators of this international crime is that they have, ever after, been ashamed of it. I well remember this. I hope redeeming sense of shame being communicated to me as a child by my mother when I asked her about the Opium War, and she told me the facts. The siren voice of history, which lured the Son of Heaven at Peking into fancying himself to be the unique representative of civilization with a capital C, was playing the same trick. In AD 1500, on his counterpart, the Caesar at Moscow, he too was the ruler of the latest avatar of a world empire that had occasionally lapsed, but so far had never failed to recover itself. The universal peace radiated by Augustus from a first Rome on the banks of the Tiber had been re-established by, re by Constantine round a second, throne, thro second Rome on the shores of the Bosphorus. And when the Constantinopolitan Empire, after dying and rising again three times over in the 7th, the 11th, and the 13th centuries of the Christian era, had fallen to the infidel Turks in 1453 AD, the scepter had passed to a third Rome at Moscow, whose kingdom was to have no end, so all pious Muscovites must believe. The Muscovite heir of Roman world power of Roman world power had inherited, by the same token, the cultural achievements of Rome's Greek predecessors. And, as if that was not enough, he was also God's chosen defender of the great alien religious faith, Christianity, which had been adopted by the pagan Greco-Roman world to make good its own spiritual shortcomings. The hair of Greece, Rome, and Christ, and through Christ of God's chosen people Israel. The title of Muscovy appeared, in Muscovite eyes, to be as conclusive as it was unique. 
If the Tsar's pretension had come to the Son of Heaven's notice, he would have he would perhaps have treated it with a certain leniency. When, fifteen hundred years or so before the Dagaman Revolution in the map of the world, the first empire of Tsin Tsin had made an adventurous voyage of exploration into the waterless sea of the steppe, and had just brushed against the first empire of Rome with the tips of its antennae. The Chinese desert marinas had previously labeled this surprising discovery Tatsin, the great China in the far west, but Tsin and Tatsin had always been insulted, insula, insulated, uh, who knows, uh, <laughs> from one another by intervening neighbors who challenged the claims of both. In Hindu eyes, for instance, the Buddhism that China had so reverently adopted from India was nothing better than a deplorable aberration, happily abandoned at home, from Hindu orthodoxy. It was the Brahmins who held a monopoly of right ritual, inspired, script, inspired scriptures, and correct theology. Much of the population, even of India, and every man, woman, and child in the world beyond the bounds of the Aryan Holy Land, were untouchable outcasts. India's Muslim conquerors might wield irresistible material power, but they could not cleanse themselves from their ritual leprosy. The Muslims, for their part, were as hard on the Hindus and, Chin and Christians as the Hindus were on the Muslims and Chinese. As the Muslims saw it, the prophets of Israel were all right, and Jesus was God's last and greatest prophet before his final messenger, Muhammad. The Muslims' quarrel was not with the prophet Jesus, but with the Christian church, which had captivated Rome by capitulating to pagan Greek polytheism and idolatry. From this shameful betrayal of the revelation of the one true God, Islam had retrieved, Islam had retrieved the pure religion of Abraham. Between the Christian polytheists on the one side and the Hindu polytheists on the other, there again shone the light of monotheism. And in Islam's survival lay the hope of the world. This traditional Islamic scale of values comes out sharply in the closing sentence of the great Egyptian historian al Gabati's na narrative of the events of the year Hijra 1213. So this year reached its close. Among the unprecedented events that occurred in it, the most portentous was the cessation of the pilgrimage from Egypt to the holy cities of the Hijaz. They did not send the holy draperies, Hiswa, or the Kaaba, and they did not send the purse, Sura. The like of this had never happened in the present age, and never during the rule of the Banu Osman. Truly, the ordering of events lies with God alone. Which was this exciting year? In our Western notation, the 12 months corresponding to AH 1213 run from June 1798 to June 1799 AD. It was, you see, the year in which Napoleon descended upon Egypt. And the sentence that I have quoted is al Gabati's grand finale to a most vivid and penetrating account of this supremely dramatic war of the worlds. Being a Martian myself, I was pulled up short, as I well remember, the first time I read those concluding words. Yet one cannot read al Gabati without taking him seriously. He would undoubtedly figure on a list of candidates for the distinction of ranking as leading historians of civilized society up to date. I shall revert to this passage and try to persuade my fellow Westerners that our Philistine inclination to laugh at it ought to move us to laugh instead at our own unconscionable parochial mindedness. For now we come to the two really laughable, fantastic cases 
of a local civilization fancying itself to be the only civilization in the world. The Japanese actually believed that their country was the land of the gods, and in consequence, inviolable to invaders, though the Chinese that though the Japanese themselves had in recent times successfully invaded it to the cost of their unlucky, unlucky Nordic predecessors, the hairy Ainu. Japan, the Middle Kingdom. Why, Japan in 1500 AD was still a feudal society and the unedifying state of anarchy from which China had been salvage, salvaged by Qin Shi Huangti in 221 BC. What China so long ago had achieved for herself unaided, Japan had failed to accomplish after ha- having enjoyed for nearly a thousand years the blessings of a borrowed Chinese secular civilization and an Indian higher religion passed on to her by Chinese good officers. Could folly fly farther? Why, yes, it would seem that it could, for the Western variant of the universal fallacy surely outfooled the Japanese. The Franks were solemnly asserting in 1500 AD that the true heir of Israel, Greece, and Rome was not the Orthodox Eastern Christendom, but theirs, and that it was not the Western but the Orthodox Church that was schismatic. To listen to the Frankish theologians, you might have have imagined that it was the four Eastern Patriarchates, not and not the Patriarchate of Rome, that had doctored the creed by slipping a filioque into it. And to listen to the Roman emperors of the German nation in their political contra- controversies with the Greek and Russian successors of Augustus and Constantine, you might have imagined that it was the Greek and Oriental provinces and not the Latin provinces in which the Roman imperial government had perished, never to revive, in the 5th century after Christ. In 1500 AD, the audacity of these Frankish pretensions to be the chosen people was enough to take away the breath of any rightly informed and properly impartial arbitrator. But a more astonishing fact remains to be recorded. Since then, four centuries and a half, And what centuries have rolled by, and the Franks are still singing the same old song today. Singing singing it solo now, too, for the other voices in the chorus of civilizations that were chanting a fallacious creed in unison in 1500 AD have one by one changed their tune between that year and this. The success of the non-Western majority of mankind in re-educating themselves, while Western minds have been sticking in archaic mud, is not, of course, in itself a proof of innately superior acumen or virtue. The beginning of wisdom is a salutary shock, and the non-Western societies had, uh, have had a tremendous shake-up administered to them by the Western civilization's boisterous impact. The West alone has so far escaped this unceremonious treatment. Unshattered up till now by an upheaval of its own making, our local civilization is still hugging the smug and slovenly illusion in which its opposite numbers indulged till they took their educative toss from the leveled horns of an unintentionally altruistic western bull. Sooner or later, the repercussions of this collision will assuredly recoil upon the west herself. But for the present, this Janus-like figure slumbers on abroad a charging bull, at home an our consolatory sleeping beauty. The shocks which the other civilizations have have received have indeed been severe enough to waken even the seventh sleepers of Ephesus. Imagine the psychological effect of the British diktat of 1842 AD on some Chinese scholar statesman who was old enough to remember the Emperor Qian Lung's handling of Lord McCartney's embassy 49 years later. Read Algabati. 
I have only space to quote his account of one incident that followed the sudden appearance on Friday the 8th. Muharram, AH 1213, of 25 foreign ships of, off the Egyptian port of Alexandria. The townspeople were wondering what the foreigners could have come for, when a little boat stood and landed, stood in and landed ten persons. These foreigners said that they were Englishmen, and they added that they were on the outlook for some Frenchmen, who had started with a considerable fleet for an unknown destination. They were afraid, they said, of seeing these Frenchmen make a surprise attack on Egypt, because they knew that the people of Egypt would not be able to repel the invaders or prevent them from landing. The foreigners went on to say, we shall be content to keep the sea with our ships in order to defend the city and patrol the coast. We shall ask you for nothing but water and provisions, and for these we will undertake to pay. The notables of the city refused, however, to enter into relations with the English, and said to them, This country belongs to the Sultan, and neither the French nor any other foreigners have any business here, so be good enough to leave us. At these words the English messengers returned to their ships, and went off to look for their provisions somewhere else instead of at Alexandria, in order that God might accomplish the work that was preordained in his decree. When one reads on, one finds that these latter-day Gesta Dei per Francos stimulated the receptive doctor of the University of Al-Hazhar Al-Hazhar, maybe to begin his own personal re-education immediately. One of the first acts of the French after occupying Cairo was to stage there a scientific exhibition with practical demonstrations. And our historian was among the visitors. After remarking that the French evidently mistook the Muslims for children who could be impressed by monkey tricks, and that this was really rather childish of the French themselves, al Gabati frankly records his admiration for the demonstrated achievements of Frankish science. <clears throat> he notices that, among the damage suffered by the French in a revolt which they had provoked by their high-handed behavior at the outset, the loss which they appeared to mind the most was that of some scientific instruments that had been destroyed in the house of the savant, Raffarelli. But al interest in French science is surpassed by his sensitiveness to French justice. French soldiers are convicted of housebreaking with violence, of housebreaking with violence, and on Napoleon's personal orders, they pay for their crime with their lives. Napoleon's successor in command of the French Army, Army of Occupation, General Kleber, is assassinated by a Muslim fanatic, and the murderer is given a genuine fair trial. This trial wins al enthusiastic admiration, and, frank as always, he records his opinion that the Muslims would not, in corresponding circumstances, have risen to that moral level. He is so intensely interested in the proceedings and so eager to preserve record of them that he incorporates the dossier of the trial in his narrative, reproducing the documents verbatim in the French military chanc chancery's defective Arabic. When one observes how quickly and readily the Egyptian Muslim scholar al Gabati learnt a French lesson that was very far from being without tears, one's mind turns to the series of great Ottoman Turkish westernizing statesmen, Mehmed Ali of Kavala, the Ma Macedonian battalion commander who came and saw what the French had been doing in Egypt and who carried on Napoleon's revolutionary work there after Napoleon had come and gone, Sultan Selim III, who lost his life at Constantinople, nine years before Napoleon's disembarkation at Alexandria, in a pioneer attempt to westernize the Ottoman army, Sultan Mahmud, 
who succeeded after half a lifetime of patient waiting in executing his martyr cousin's political testament, and, last but not least, President Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who completed in our lifetime the totalitarian revolution in Ottoman Turkish life that Sultan Selim had initiated some some six generations earlier. These Ottoman names recall their counterparts elsewhere. The Ark Westernizer, Peter the Great, and his Bolshevik executors, the shrewd architects of the Meiji Restoration in Japan, the Bengali syncretist Ram Mohan Roy, who, by carrying the issue onto the terrain of religion, showed the characteristic Hindu feeling for the true relative values of matter and spirit, however indignantly the orthodox Hindu pandits of the day might shake the dust off the, the dust of this heresiarch's defiling threshold from off their own unprofitably unsullied feet. At the inspiration or behest of these mighty Herodians and the driving force that and the driving force has usually been a cross between persuasion and compulsion, a younger generation of non-Westerners from all the once separate societies, which the West has now swept together in its world-enveloping net, has literally been coming to school in the West in our day. They are taking Western lessons at first hand in the universities of Paris and Cambridge and Oxford, at Columbia, and at Chicago. And, as I was scanning the faces of my audience in the Senate House of the University of London, I saw, to my pleasure, a contingent of their representatives there. An elite in all the non-Western societies has in fact by now successfully re-educated itself out of its traditional self-centered parochial point of view. Some of them, alas, have caught, instead, the Western ideological disease of nationalism. But even nationalism has, for non-Westerners, at least the negative merit of being an exotic infirmity. It, too, draws them out of their ancestral shell. In short, by one road or another, the emotional ups- emotionally upsetting but intellectually stimulating experience of being taken by storm by the West has educated these non-Western students of human affairs into realizing, and what an effort of imagination this implies, that the history of the West, past history of the West is not just the West's own parochial concern, but is their past history too. It is theirs because the West, like those housebreaking French soldiers at Cairo, whose executions by Napoleon, Algabati records, has thrust its way into its defenseless neighbors' lives, and these neighbors must therefore familiarize themselves with Western history, if they are to learn how to take their bearings in a new worldwide society of which we Westerners have made them members by main force. The paradox of our generation is that all the world has now profited by an education which the West has provided, except, as we have observed already, the West herself. The West today is still looking at history from that old parochial self-centered standpoint which the other living societies have by now been compelled to transcend. Yet, sooner or later, The West, in her turn, is bound to receive the re-education which the other civilizations have obtained already from the unification of the world by Western action. What is the probable course of this coming Western mental and moral revolution? Wending our way, as we have to do, with our noses up against an iron curtain that debars us from foreseeing our own future, we may perhaps gain some illuminating sidelights from the histories of older contemporaries, where we know the whole story because the dramatis personae have already departed this life.
What, for instance, was the sequel to the impact of the Greco-Roman civilization on its neighbors? If we follow the thread through 16 or 17 centuries, from the Katab- Katabasis of Xenophon's 10,000 companions, companions in arm, from the Katabasis of Xenophon's 10,000 companions in arm, to the latest achievements of the Greek-inspired, Mus- and Greek-inspired Muslim, science, Muslim science and philosophy before the Mongol cataclysm, we shall see an apparently irresistible Greek offensive on the military, political, economic, intellectual, and artistic planes being progressively contained, halted, and thrown into reverse by the countermeasures of its non-Greek victims. On all the planes on which they had been attacked, the Oriental's counteroffensive was successful on the whole. But, but it was checkered in its fortunes, and sometimes ironical in its consequences. There is, however, one point. Religion. The Greek Achilles heel, at which the Oriental counterstroke went home and made history. This fully told yet all but contemporary tell has an evident bearing on our own prospects. For a spiritual vacuum like the hollow place at the heart of that Hellenic culture which the Greeks temporarily imposed on the world has latterly made its appearance uh, has latterly made its appearance in the culture of our own of our own Western Christendom and the form in which this culture has been processed for export. For some two hundred years, dating from the beginning of the pre dagaman era, our world-storming Western forefathers made a valiant attempt to propagate abroad the whole of our Western cultural heritage, including its religious core as well as its technological rind. And in this they were surely well inspired, for every culture is a whole, whose parts are subtly ended interdependent, and to export the husk, without the grain, may be as deadly as to radiate the satellite electrons of an atom without the nucleus. <clears throat> and I have some wine here. It's a good Cabernet. However, about the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries of our our Western Christian era, something happened which, I venture to prophesy, is going to loom out in retrospect as one of the epic-making events of our modern Western history, when this local history is seen in its true light as an incident in the general history of mankind. This portent was a double event in which the Jesuits' failure was accentuated by the Royal Society's simultaneous success. The Jesuits failed to convert the Hindus and Chinese to the Roman Catholic form of Western Christianity. They failed, though they had discovered the psychological know-how, because, when it came to the point, neither the Pope nor the Son of Heaven nor the Brahmins would have it. In the same generation, these tragically frustrated Jesuit minis- missionaries, fellow Western Catholics and Protestants at home, came to, the hazardo- came to the hazardous conclusion that a religion in whose now divided and contentious name they had been fighting an inconclusive frat- Oh, I'll just restart that. In the same generation... These tragically frustrated Jesuit missionaries, fellow Western Catholics and Protestants at home, came to the hazardous conclusion that a religion in whose now divided and contentious name they had been fighting an inconclusive inconclusive fratricidal hundred years war was an inopportune element in their cultural heritage. Why not tacitly agree to cut out the wars of religion by cutting cutting our religion itself and concentrate on the application of physical science to practical affairs. 
a pursuit which aroused no contra- controversy and which promised to be lucrative. A pursuit which aroused no controversy and which promised to be lucrative? This 17th century turning in the road of Western progress was big with consequences. For the Western civilization that has since run like wildfire around the, the world has not been the whole of the seamless web. It has been a flare, in cotton wa- a flare of cotton waste, a technological salvage with the religious centerpiece torn out. This utility pattern of Western civilization was, of course, comparatively easy to take. Peter the Great revealed his genius by instantly pouncing on it as soon as it was displayed in the West's shop window. A hundred years later, the subtler and more spiritual Algabati showed a nicer distinct discrimination. French technology hit him in the eye, but he persisted in waiting for a sign. For him, the touchstone of Western civilization, as of his own, was not technology, but justice. This Kyrene scholar had apprehended the heart of the matter, the issue which the West has still to fight out within itself. And though I... And though I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and have not charity, I am nothing. 1 Corinthians 13. 2. Or what man is there of you, whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Matthew 7, 9 and 10 This brings us back to a question, raised by a sentence of Algabates, which is still awaiting our answer. Which really was the most important event of AH 1213? Napoleon's invasion of Egypt, or the intermission of the annual pilgrimage from Egypt to the holy cities in the Hejaz. The Islamic institution of the pilgrimage is, of course, in itself, nothing more than an ex- exacting and external observance. But as a symbol, it stands for the fraternal spirit that binds all Muslims together. Islam is therefore in danger when the pilgrimage falls off, as we have learnt by experience in our own lifetime, and al Gabati was sensitive to this danger, because he valued the spiritual treasure with which his ancestral religion was freighted. What value are we to place on Islam ourselves? In a chapter of world history in which the mastery of the world seems likely to lie in the hands of the conspicuously infra-pigmented and notoriously race-conscious transmarine English-speaking peoples, can mankind afford to do without the social cement of Islamic fraternity? Yet this social service, valuable and noble though it be, is not the essence of Islam as al Gabati would have been quick to point out to us, though he happened himself to be, to be a living embodiment of this particular virtue of his faith. As his surname records, al Gabati was hereditary master of one of those nations that were the constituents of the University of Al-Hazar, as they were of, it, of its contemporary, the Sorbonne. And who were his nation of the Gabat? They were the Trans-Abyssinian Gallus and Somalis, true-believing, true ebony-coloured children of Ham. You will perceive that our hero's surname and personal name were felicitously matched. The surname al Gabati, the Ethiop, personal name abd rahman the servant of the God of mercy. Yet this worshipper of a compassionate God would have testified that, if the pilgrimage is merely the symbol of a fraternity, the transcending differences of color and class, this unity between true believers is, in turn, merely a translation into action here on earth of their true belief in the unity of God. 
Islam's creative gift to mankind is monotheism. And we surely dare not throw this gift away. And what about the Battle of the Pyramids? Last year, when for the second time in my life, I was attending a peace conference in Paris, I found myself one Sunday morning, sitting on a temporary wooden bench, wooden stand, and watching the French victory march defiling past me, Spahis on dancing white horses, and Tunisian light infantry led by a sedately drilled and smartly caparison, capar, caparisoned sheep. With the Arc de Triomphe staring me in the fa- fa- face on the farther side of the procession's route, staring back at the, that imposing pile of masonry, my eye began to walk, travel along the row of round shields below the cornice, each bearing the name of one of Napoleon's victories. It is perhaps a good thing, I caught myself thinking as my eye reached the corner, that this monument is only four square and not octagonal. Or, if they had more room, they would have had to come, in the end, to Sedan and the Battle of France. And then my mind flitted to the equally ironical ends of other chains of national glories. A German chain in which the Battle of France had been followed within four years by the Battle of Germany, and a British chain of victories in India beginning with Plassey and Assai, and running through the sonorous Punjabi names of stricken fields in the Anglo-Sikh wars. What, in the final account, did these Western national victories amount to? To the same zero figure as the national victories, not less famous in their day, of those Chinese contending state with Xin Shi Huangti swept off the map in the 3rd century BC. Vanity of vanities. But Islam remains with a mighty spiritual mission to carry out. So, who has the last laugh in this controversy over al sense of proportion? al Western readers, or al himself? Now, what must we as Westerners do if we aspire, like Cleanthes, to follow the beck of Zeus and fate by using our intelligence and exercising our free will, instead of constraining those dread deities to bring us into line by the humiliating method of compulsion? First, I would suggest, we need to, we must readjust our own historical outlook on the lines on which the educated representatives of our, of our sister societies have been readjusting theirs during these last few generations. Our non-Western contemporaries have grasped the fact that, in consequence of the recent unification of the world, our past history has become a vital part of theirs. Reciprocally, we mentally still slumbering Westerners, have now to realize on our part that, in virtue of the same revolution, a revolution, after all, that has been brought about by ourselves, our neighbor's past is going to become a vital part of our own Western future. In rousing ourselves to make this effort of imagination, we do not have to start quite from the beginning. We have always realized and acknowledged our debt to Israel, Greece, and Rome. But these, of course, are extinct civilizations. And we have managed to pay our homage to them, without budging from our traditional self-centered standpoint, because we have taken it for granted, in the blindness of our, our egoism, that our noble selves are those dead civilizations raison d'être. We imagined them living and dying for the sake of preparing the way for us, playing John the Baptist to our own role as the Christ. 
I apologize for the blasphemy of this comparison. But it does bring out sharply how outrageously distorted our outlook has been. We have latterly also realized the importance, as contributors to our own past, of certain other civilizations which were not only extinct, but which had lain buried in oblivion before we disinterred their debris. It is easy for us to be generous in our acknowledgments to Minoan, Hittites, and Sumerians, for their rediscovery has been a ca- feather in our Western scholars' cap, and they have made their a reappearance on the stage of history under our patronage. It will be harder for us to accept the not less plain fact that the past histories of our vociferous and sometimes vituperative living contemporaries, the Chinese and the Japanese, the Hindus and the Muslims, and our elder brothers, the Orthodox Christians, are going to become a part of our Western past history and a future world which will be neither Western nor non-Western, but will inherit all the cultures which we Westerners have now brewed together in a single crucible. Yet this is the manifest truth when we face it. Our own descendants are not going to be just Western, like ourselves. They are going to be heirs of Confucius and Lao Tse, as well as Socrates, Plato and Plotinus, heirs of Gautama Buddha, as well as Deutero Isaiah and Jesus Christ, heirs of Zarathustra and Muhammad, as well as Elijah and Elisha and Peter and Paul, heirs of Shankara and Ram, Ramanuja, as well as Clement and Origen, as of the Cappadocian fathers of the Orthodox Church, as well as our African August, Augustine and our Umbrian Benedict, as of Ibn Khaldun, as well as Boswe, and has, if still wallowing in the Serbian Serbonian bog of politics, of Lenin and Gandhi, and Sun Yat-sen, as well as Cromwell and George Washington and Mazzini. A readjustment of historical outlook demands a corresponding revision of methods and historical study, recapturing, if we can, an old-fashioned mode of thought and feeling. Let us confess with great humility that through the providences of God, providence of God, the historic achievement of Western man has been to do something not simply for himself, but for mankind as a whole, something so big that our own parochial history is going to be swallowed up by the results of it. By making history, we have transcended our own history. Without knowing what we have been doing, we have taken the opportunity offered to us. To be allowed to fulfill oneself by surpassing oneself is a glorious privilege for any of God's creatures. On this view, then, a humble view, and yet a proud view, too. The main strand of our modern Western history is not the parish pump of parish pump politics of our Western society as inscribed on triumphal arches in half and a half dozen parochial capitals, or recorded in the national and municipal archives of ephemeral great powers. The main strand is not even the expansion of the West over the world so long as we persist in thinking of that expansion as a private enterprise of the West and society's own. The main strand is the progressive erection by Western hands of a scaffolding within which all the once separate societies have built themselves into one. From the beginning, mankind has been partitioned in our day. Partitioned. In our day, we have at last become united. The Western handiwork that has made this union possible has not been carried out with open eyes, like David's unselfish labors for the benefit of Solomon. It has been performed in heedless ignorance of its purpose, like the labors of the animalculi that build up, build a coral reef up from the bottom of the sea till at length an atoll rises above the waves. 
but our western-built scaffolding is made of less durable materials than that. The most obvious ingredient in it is technology, and man cannot live by technology alone. In the fullness of time, when the ecumenical house of many mansions stands firmly on its own foundations, and the temporary western technological scaffolding falls away, as I have no doubt that it will, I believe it will become manifest that the foundations are firm at last because they have been carried down to the bedrock of religion. We have reached the pillars of Hercules, and it is time to draw and sell, for we cannot see clearly very much farther ahead. In the chapter of history on which we are now entering, the seat of material power is moving away at this moment, still, far, still farther away from its pre dagaman locus, from the small island of Britain lying a stone's throw from the Atlantic coast of the continent of Asia. It is moving to the larger island of North America, a bow shot farther distant. But this transfer of Poseidon's trident from London to New York may prove to have marked the culmination of the dislocating effects of our current oceanic age of intercommunication. For we are now passing into a new age in which the material medium of human intercourse is going to be neither the steppe nor the ocean, but the air. And in an air age, mankind may succeed in shaking its wings free from their fledgling bondage to the freakish configuration of the surface, solid or liquid, of the globe. In an air age, the locus of the center of gravity of human affairs may be determined not by physical, but by human geography, not by the layout of oceans and seas, steppes and deserts, rivers and mountain ranges, passes and straits, but by the distribution of human numbers, energy, ability, skill, and character. And among these human factors, the weight of numbers may eventually come to count for more than its influence in the past. The separate civilizations of the pre-Dagaman age were created and enjoyed, as we have observed, by a tiny sophisticated ruling minority, perched on the back of a Neolithic peasantry, as Sinbad the sailor was ridden by the old man of the sea. This Neolithic peasantry is the last and mightiest sleeper, before herself, whom the West has waked. The rousing of this passively industrious ma mass of humanity has been a slow business. Athens and Florence each flashed her brief candle in the sleeper's drowsy eyes, but each time he just turned on turned onto his side and sank to sleep again. It was left for modern England to urbanize the peasantry with sufficient energy on a large enough scale to set the movement traveling round the circumference of the earth. The peasant has not waken, taken this awakening kindly. Even in the Americas he has contrived to remain much as he was in Mexico and the Andean republics, and he has struck new roots on virgin soil in the province of Quebec. Yet the process of his awakening has been gathering momentum. The French Revolution carried it on to the continent. The Russian Revolution has propagated it from coast to coast, and though today there are still some 1,500 million not yet awakened peasants, about three quarters of the living generation of mankind in India, China, Indochina, Indonesia, Dar al Islam, and Eastern Europe, their awakening is now only a matter of time, and when it has been accomplished, numbers will begin to tell. Their gravitational pull may then draw the center point of human affairs away from, the, from an ultimate Thule, among the isles of the sea, to some locus approximately equidistant from the western pole of the world's population in Europe and North America, and its eastern pole in China and India, 
and this would indicate a site in the neighborhood of Babylon, on the ancient portage across the isthmus between the continent and its peninsulas of Arabia and Africa. The center might even travel farther into the interior of the continent, to some locus between China and Russia, the two historic tamers of the Eurasian nomads, and that would indicate a site in the neighborhood of Babur's Fakhana, in the familiar Transoxanian meeting place and debating ground of the religions and philosophies of India, China, Iran, Syria, and Greece. Of one thing, we can be fairly confident. Religion is likely to be the plane on which this coming centripetal counter-movement will first declare itself, and this probability offers us a further hint for the revision of our traditional Western methods of studying studying history. If our first precept should be to study our own history, not on its own account, but for the part which the West has played in the unification of mankind, our second precept in studying history as a whole should be to relegate economic and political history to a subordinate place and give religious history the primacy. For religion, after all, is the serious business of the human race.